Chapter 7 of Arsène Lupin vs. Herlock Sholmes by Maurice Leblanc, The Jewish Lamp Herlock Sholmes and Wilson were sitting in front of the fireplace, in comfortable armchairs, with the feet extended toward the grateful warmth of a glowing coke fire. Sholmes's pipe, a short briar with a silver band, had gone out. He knocked out the ashes, filled it, lighted it, pulled the skirts of his dressing gown over his knees, and drew from his pipe great puffs of smoke, which ascended toward the ceiling in scores of shadow rings. Wilson gazed at him, as a dog lying curled up on a rug before the fire might look at his master, with great round eyes which have no hope other than to obey the least gesture of his owner. Was the master going to break the silence? Would he reveal to Wilson the subject of his reverie and admit his satellite into the charmed realm of his thoughts? When Sholmes had maintained his silent attitude for some time, Wilson ventured to speak. "'Everything seems quiet now. Not the shadow of a case to occupy our leisure moments.' Sholmes did not reply, but the rings of smoke emitted by Sholmes were better formed, and Wilson observed that his companion drew considerable pleasure from that trifling fact, an indication that the great man was not absorbed in any serious meditation. Wilson, discouraged, arose and went to the window. The lonely street extended between the gloomy facades of grimy houses, unusually gloomy this morning by reason of a heavy downfall of rain. A cab passed, then another. Wilson made an entry of their numbers in his memorandum book. One never knows. Ah! he exclaimed. The postman! The man entered, shown in by the servant. Two registered letters, sir! "'If you will sign, please.' Sholmes signed the receipts, accompanied the man to the door, and was accompanying one of the letters as he returned. "'It seems to please you,' remarked Wilson, after a moment's silence. "'This letter contains a very interesting proposition. You are anxious for a case? Here's one. Read.' Wilson read. "'Monsieur, I desire the benefit of your services and experience.' I have been the victim of a serious theft, and the investigation has as yet been unsuccessful. I am sending to you by this mail a number of newspapers which will inform you of the affair, and if you will undertake the case, I will place my house at your disposal and ask you to fill in the enclosed check, signed by me, for whatever sum you require for your expenses. Kindly reply by telegraph, and much oblige, your humble servant, Baron Victor Dimbleval, Eighteen Rue Murillo, Paris. Ah, exclaimed Sholmes, that sounds good. A little trip to Paris. And why not, Wilson? Since my famous duel with Arsène Lupin, I have not had an excuse to go there. I should be pleased to visit the capital of the world under less strenuous conditions. He tore the check into four pieces, and while Wilson, whose arm had not yet regained its former strength, uttered bitter words against Paris and the Parisians, Sholmes opened the second envelope. Immediately he made a gesture of annoyance, and a wrinkle appeared on his forehead during the reading of the letter. Then, crushing the paper into a ball, he threw it angrily on the floor. "'Well, what's the matter?' asked Wilson, anxiously. He picked up the ball of paper, unfolded it, and read with increasing amazement, "'My dear monsieur, you know full well the admiration I have for you and the interest I take in your renown. Well, believe me when I warn you to have nothing whatever to do with the case on which you have just now been called to Paris. Your intervention will cause much harm, your efforts will produce a most lamentable result, and you will be obliged to make a public confession of your defeat.' Having a sincere desire to spare you much humiliation, I implore you, in the name of the friendship that unites us, to remain peacefully reposing at your own fireside. My best wishes to Monsieur Wilson, and for yourself, the sincere regards of your devoted Arsène Lupin. Arsène Lupin! repeated Wilson, astounded. Sholmes struck the table with his fist and exclaimed, Ah! He is pestering me already, the fool. He laughs at me as if I were a schoolboy. The public confession of my defeat. Didn't I force him to disgorge the blue diamond? I tell you, he's afraid, suggested Wilson. Nonsense. Arsène Lupin is not afraid. 
and this taunting letter proves it. But how did he know that the Baron Dimbleval had written to you? What do I know about it? You do ask some stupid questions, my boy. I thought, I supposed, what, that I'm a clairvoyant, or a sorcerer? No, but I have seen you do some marvellous things. No person can perform marvellous things. I know more than you. I reflect, I deduct, I conclude, that is all. But I do not divine. Only fools divine. Wilson assumed the attitude of a whipped cur, and resolved not to make a fool of himself by trying to divine why Sholmes paced the room with quick, nervous strides. But when Sholmes rang for the servant and ordered his valise, Wilson thought that he was in possession of a material fact which gave him the right to reflect, deduct, and conclude that his associate was about to take a journey. The same mental operation permitted him to assert, with almost mathematical exactness, Sholmes, you are going to Paris. Possibly. And Lupin's affront impels you to go, rather than the desire to assist the Baron Dimbleval. Possibly. Sholmes, I shall go with you. Ah, ah, my old friend, exclaimed Sholmes, interrupting his walking. You are not afraid that your right arm will meet the same fate as your left? What can happen to me? You will be there. That's the way to talk, Wilson. We will show that clever Frenchman that he made a mistake when he threw his glove in our faces. Be quick, Wilson. We must catch the first train. Without waiting for the papers the Baron has sent you? What good are they? I will send a telegram. No. If you do that, Arsène Lupin will know of my arrival. I wish to avoid that. This time, Wilson, we must fight under cover. That afternoon, the two friends embarked at Dover. The passage was a delightful one. In the train from Calais to Paris, Sholmes had three hours of sound sleep, while Wilson guarded the door of the compartment. Sholmes awoke in good spirits. He was delighted at the idea of another duel with Arsène Lupin, and he rubbed his hands with the satisfied air of a man who looks forward to a pleasant vacation. "'At last!' exclaimed Wilson. "'We are getting to work again!' And he rubbed his hands with the same satisfied air. At the station, Sholmes took the wraps, and, followed by Wilson, who carried the valises, he gave up his tickets and started off briskly. "'Fine weather, Wilson! Blue sky and sunshine! Paris is giving us a royal reception!' "'Yes, but what a crowd! So much the better, Wilson. We will pass unnoticed. No one will recognize us in such a crowd.' "'Is this Monsieur Sholmes?' He stopped, somewhat puzzled. Who the deuce could thus address him by his name? A woman stood beside him, a young girl whose simple dress outlined her slender form and whose pretty face had a sad and anxious expression. She repeated her inquiry. "'You are Monsieur Sholmes?' As he still remained silent, as much from confusion as from a habit of prudence, the girl asked a third time, "'Have I the honor of addressing Monsieur Sholmes?' "'What do you want?' he replied, testily, considering the incident a suspicious one. "'You must listen to me, Monsieur Sholmes, as it is a serious matter. I know that you are going to the Rue Murillo.' "'What do you say?' "'I know. I know. Rue Murillo, number eighteen. Well, you must not go. No, you must not. I assure you that you will regret it. Do not think that I have any interest in the matter. I do it because it is right, because my conscience tells me to do it. Sholmes tried to get away, but she persisted. Oh, I beg of you, don't neglect my advice. Ah, if I only knew how to convince you. Look at me. Look into my eyes. They are sincere. They speak the truth. She gazed at Sholmes, fearlessly but innocently, with those beautiful eyes, serious and clear, in which her very soul seemed to be reflected. Wilson nodded his head, as he said, "'Mademoiselle looks honest.' "'Yes,' she implored, "'and you must have confidence.' "'I have confidence in you, mademoiselle,' replied Wilson. "'Oh, how happy you make me! And so has your friend. I feel it.' I am sure of it. What happiness! 
Everything will be all right now. What a good idea of mine. Ah, yes, there is a train for Calais in twenty minutes. You will take it. Quick, follow me. You must come this way. There is just time. She tried to drag them along. Sholmes seized her arm, and, in as gentle a voice as he could assume, said to her, "'Excuse me, mademoiselle, if I cannot yield to your wishes, but I never abandon a task that I have once undertaken.' "'I beseech you! I, I implore you! Ah, if only you could understand!' Sholmes passed outside and walked away at a quick pace. Wilson said to the girl, "'Have no fear. He will be in at the finish. He never failed yet.' and he ran to overtake Sholmes. Herlock Sholmes, Arsène Lupin. These words, in great black letters, met their gaze as soon as they left the railway station. A number of sandwichmen were parading through the street, one behind the other, carrying heavy canes with iron ferrules in which they struck the pavement in harmony, and, on their backs, they carried large posters, on which one could read the following notice. The match between Herlock Sholmes and Arsène Lupin, arrival of the English champion. The great detective attacks the mystery of the Rue Murillo. Read the details in the Echo de France. Wilson shook his head and said, Look at that, Sholmes, and we thought we were traveling incognito. I shouldn't be surprised to find the Republican Guard waiting for us at the Rue Murillo to give us an official reception with toasts and champagne. "'Wilson, when you get funny, you get beastly funny,' growled Sholmes. Then he approached one of the sandwich men with the obvious intention of seizing him in his powerful grip and crushing him, together with his infernal signboard. There was quite a crowd gathered about the men, reading the notices and joking and laughing. Repressing a furious access of rage, Sholmes said to the man, "'When did they hire you?' "'This morning.' How long have you been parading? A about an hour. But the boards were ready before that. Oh, yes, they were ready when we went to the agency this morning. So then it appears that Arsène Lupin had foreseen that he, Sholmes, would accept the challenge. More than that, the letter written by Lupin showed that he was eager for the fray, and that he was prepared to measure swords once more with his formidable rival. Why? What motive could Arsène Lupin have in renewing the struggle? Sholmes hesitated for a moment. Lupin must be very confident of his success to show so much insolence in advance. And was not he, Sholmes, falling into a trap by rushing into the battle at the first call for help? However, he called a carriage. Come, Wilson! Driver! 18 Rue Murillo! he exclaimed, with an outburst of his accustomed energy. With distended veins and clenched fists, as if he were about to engage in a boxing bout, he jumped into the carriage. The Rue Murillo is bordered with magnificent private residences, the rear of which overlook the Parc Monceau. One of the most pretentious of these houses is number 18, owned and occupied by the Baron d'Imbelval and furnished in a luxurious manner consistent with the owner's taste and wealth. There was a courtyard in front of the house, and, in the rear, a garden well filled with trees whose branches mingle with those of the park. After ringing the bell, the two Englishmen were admitted, crossed the courtyard, and were received at the door by a footman who showed them into a small parlor facing the garden in the rear of the house. They sat down, and, glancing about, made a rapid inspection of the many valuable objects with which the room was filled. "'Everything very choice.' murmured Wilson, and in the best of taste. It is a safe deduction to make that those who had the leisure to collect these articles must now be at least fifty years of age. The door opened, and the Baron Dimbleval entered, followed by his wife. Contrary to the deduction made by Wilson, they were both quite young, of elegant appearance, and vivacious in speech and action. They were profuse in their expressions of gratitude. "'So kind of you to come. Sorry to have caused you so much trouble. The theft now seems of little consequence, since it has procured us this pleasure.' "'How charming these French people are,' thought Wilson, evolving one of his most commonplace deductions. "'But—' 
"'Time is money,' exclaimed the Baron. "'Especially your time, Monsieur Sholmes. Uh, "'So I will come to the point. "'Now, what do you think of the affair? "'Do you think you can succeed in it?' "'Before I can answer, I must know what it is about.' "'I thought you knew.' "'No. "'So I must ask you for full particulars, "'even to the smallest detail. First, what is the nature of the case?' "'A theft. "'When did it take place?' Uh, "'Last Saturday,' replied the Baron. "'Or, at least, some time during Saturday night or Sunday morning.' "'That was six days ago. "'Now, you can tell me all about it.' "'In the first place, monsieur, "'I must tell you that my wife and I, "'conforming to the manner of life that our position demands, "'go out very little. "'The education of our children, "'a few receptions, and the care and decoration of our house, "'such constitutes our life. "'And nearly all our evenings are spent in this little room, "'which is my wife's boudoir, "'and in which we have gathered a few artistic objects.' Last Saturday night, about eleven o'clock, I had turned off the electric lights, and my wife and I retired, as usual, to our room. Where's your room? It adjoins this. That is the door. Next morning, that is to say, Sunday morning, I arose quite early. As Suzanne, my wife, was still asleep, I passed into the boudoir as quietly as possible so as not to wake her. What was my astonishment when I found that window open? "'as we had left it closed the evening before. "'A servant? Uh, "'No one enters here in the morning until we ring. Uh, "'Besides, I always take the precaution to bolt the second door "'which communicates with the antechamber. "'Therefore, the window must have been opened from the outside. "'Besides, I have some evidence of that. "'The second pane of glass from the right, uh, close to the fastening, had been cut. "'And what does that window overlook?' As you can see for yourself, it opens on a little balcony, surrounded by a stone railing. Here, we are on the first floor, and you can see the garden behind the house and the iron fence which separates it from the Parc Monceau. It is quite certain that the thief came through the park, climbed the fence by the aid of a ladder, and thus reached the terrace below the window. That is quite certain, you say? Well, in the soft earth on either side of the fence... They found the two holes made by the bottom of the ladder, and two similar holes can be seen below the window, and the stone railing of the balcony shows two scratches which were doubtless made by the contact of the ladder. Is the Parc Monceau closed at night? No, but if it were, there is a house in course of erection at number 14, and a person could enter that way. Herlock Sholmes reflected for a few minutes, and then said, let us come down to the theft. It must have been committed in this room. Yes. There was here, between that twelfth-century virgin and that tabernacle of chased silver, a small Jewish lamp. It has disappeared. And is that all? That is all. Ah. And what is a Jewish lamp? One of those copper lamps used by the ancient Jews— consisting of a standard which supported a bowl containing the oil, and from this bowl projected several burners intended for the wicks. Upon the whole, an object of small value. No great value, of course, but this one contained a secret hiding place in which we were accustomed to place a magnificent jewel, a chimera in gold with rubies and emeralds, which was of great value. Why did you hide it there? "'Oh, I can't give any reason, monsieur, unless it was an odd fancy to utilize a hiding-place of that kind. "'Did anyone know it?' "'No.' "'No one except the thief,' said Sholmes. "'Otherwise he would not have taken the trouble to steal the lamp.' "'Of course. But how could he know it, as it was only by accident that the secret mechanism of the lamp was revealed to us?' A similar accident has revealed it to someone else, a servant, or an acquaintance. But let us proceed. I suppose the police have been notified? Yes. The examining magistrate has completed his investigation. The reported detectives attached to the leading newspapers have also made their investigations. But, as I wrote to you, it seems to me the mystery will never be solved. Sholmes arose, went to the window, examined the casement— the balcony, the terrace, 
studied the scratches on the stone railing with his magnifying glass, and then requested Monsieur Dimbleval to show him the garden. Outside, Sholmes sat down in a rattan chair and gazed at the roof of the house in a dreamy way. Then he walked over to the two little wooden boxes with which they had covered the holes made in the ground by the bottom of the ladder, with a view of preserving them intact. He raised the boxes, kneeled on the ground, scrutinized the holes, and made some measurements. After making a similar examination of the holes near the fence, he and the baron returned to the boudoir, where Madame Dimbleval was waiting for them. After a short silence, Sholmes said, "'At the very outset of your story, baron, I was surprised at the very simple methods employed by the thief. To raise a ladder, cut a window-pane, select a valuable article, and walk out again. No, that is not the way such things are done. All that is too plain, too simple.' "'Well, what do you think?' "'That the Jewish lamp was stolen under the direction of Arsène Lupin.' "'Arsène Lupin!' exclaimed the baron. "'Yes, but he did not do it himself, as no one came from the outside. "'Perhaps a servant descended from the upper floor by means of a water-spout that I noticed when I was in the garden. "'What makes you think so?' "'Arsène Lupin would not leave this room empty-handed.' "'Empty-handed? But he had the lamp!' but that would not have prevented his taking that snuff-box set with diamonds or that opal necklace. When he leaves anything, it is because he can't carry it away. But the marks of the ladder outside! A false scent, placed there simply to avert suspicion. And the scratches on the balustrade? A farce! They were made with a piece of sandpaper. See, here are scraps of the paper that I picked up in the garden. And what about the marks made by the bottom of the letter? Counterfeit. Examine the two rectangular holes below the window and the two holes near the fence. They are of a similar form, but I find that the two holes near the house are closer to each other than the two holes near the fence. What does that fact suggest? To me, it suggested that the four holes were made by a piece of wood prepared for the purpose. The better proof would be the piece of wood itself. Here it is said Sholmes. I found it in the garden, under the box of a laurel tree. The baron bowed to Sholmes in recognition of his skill. Only forty minutes had elapsed since the Englishman had entered the house, and he had already exploded all the theories theretofore formed, and which had been based on what appeared to be obvious and undeniable facts. But what now appeared to be the real facts of the case rested upon a more solid foundation, to wit, the astute reasoning of a Herlock Sholmes. "'The accusation which you make against one of our household is a very serious matter,' said the Baroness. "'Our servants have been with us a long time, and none of them would betray our trust.' "'If none of them has betrayed you, how can you explain the fact that I received this letter on the same day, and by the same mail as the letter you wrote to me?' He handed to the Baroness the letter that he had received from Arsène Lupin. She exclaimed in amazement, "'Arsène Lupin? How could he know?' "'Did you tell anyone that you had written to me?' Uh, "'No one,' replied the Baron. "'The idea occurred to us the other evening at the dinner-table.' "'Before the servants?' "'No. Only our two children. Oh, no. Sophie and Henriette had left the table, hadn't they, Suzanne?' Madame Dimbleval, after a moment's reflection, replied, "'Yes, they had gone to Mademoiselle.' "'Mademoiselle?' queried Sholmes. "'The governess, Mademoiselle Alice de Moon. "'Does she take her meals with you?' "'No, her meals are served in her room.' Wilson had an idea. He said, "'The letter written to my friend Herlock Sholmes was posted?' "'Of course.' Who posted it? Dominique, who has been my valet for twenty years, replied the baron. Any search in that direction would be a waste of time. One never wastes his time when engaged in a search, said Wilson sententiously. This preliminary investigation now ended, and Sholmes asked permission to retire. At dinner, an hour later, he saw Sophie and Henriette, the two children of the family. 
one was six and the other eight years of age. There was very little conversation at the table. Sholmes responded to the friendly advances of his hosts in such a curt manner that they were soon reduced to silence. When the coffee was served, Sholmes swallowed the contents of his cup and rose to take his leave. At that moment, a servant entered with a telephone message addressed to Sholmes. He opened it and read, "'You have my enthusiastic admiration. The results attained by you in so short a time are simply marvellous. I am dismayed. Arsène Lupin.' Sholmes made a gesture of indignation and handed the message to the baron, saying, "'What do you think now, monsieur? Are the walls of your house furnished with eyes and ears?' "'I don't understand it,' said the baron, in amazement. "'Nor do I. "'But I do understand that Lupin has knowledge of everything that occurs in this house. "'He knows every movement, every word. "'There is no doubt of it. "'But how does he get his information? "'That is the first mystery I have to solve. "'And when I know that, I will know everything.' "'That night,' Wilson retired with the clear conscience of a man who has performed his whole duty, and thus acquired an undoubted right to sleep and repose. So he fell asleep very quickly, and was soon enjoying the most delightful dreams in which he pursued Lupin and captured him single-handed, and the sensation was so vivid and exciting that it woke him from his sleep. Someone was standing at his bedside. He seized his revolver and cried, "'Don't move, Lupin, or I'll fire! The deuce!' "'Wilson, what do you mean?' "'Oh, it is you, Sholmes. Uh, "'Do you want me?' "'I want to show you something. Get up.' Sholmes led him to the window and said, "'Look, on the other side of the fence.' "'In the park?' "'Yes. What do you see?' Uh, "'I don't see anything.' "'Yes, you do see something.' "'Ah, of course. A shadow. Two of them.' "'Yes.' close to the fence. See, they are moving. Come, quick! Quickly they descended the stairs, and reached a room which opened into the garden. Through the glass door they could see two shadowy forms in the same place. It is very strange, said Sholmes, but it seems to me I can hear a noise inside the house. Inside the house? Impossible! Everybody is asleep. Well, listen! At that moment, a low whistle came from the other side of the fence, and they perceived a dim light which appeared to come from the house. The Baron must have turned on the light in his room. It is just above us. That must have been the noise you heard, said Wilson. Perhaps they are watching the fence also. Then there was a second whistle, softer than before. I don't understand it. I don't understand, said Sholmes irritably. No more do I, confessed Wilson. Sholmes turned the key, drew the bolt, and quietly opened the door. A third whistle, louder than before, and modulated to another form. And the noise above their heads became more pronounced. Sholmes said, It seems to be on the balcony outside the boudoir window. He put his head through the half-opened door, but immediately recoiled with a stifled oath. Then Wilson looked. Quite close to them there was a ladder the upper end of which was resting on the balcony. "'The deuce,' said Sholmes. "'There is someone in the boudoir. "'That is what we heard. "'Quick, let us remove the ladder.' But at that instant, a man slid down the ladder and ran toward the spot where his accomplices were waiting for him outside the fence. He carried the ladder with him. Sholmes and Wilson pursued the man and overtook him just as he was placing the ladder against the fence. From the other side of the fence, two shots were fired. "'Wounded?' cried Sholmes. "'No,' replied Wilson. Wilson seized the man by the body and tried to hold him, but the man turned and plunged a knife into Wilson's breast. He uttered a groan, staggered, and fell. "'Damnation!' muttered Sholmes. "'If they have killed him, I will kill them.' He laid Wilson on the grass and rushed toward the ladder. Too late. The man had climbed the fence and, accompanied by his confederates, had fled through the bushes." Wilson! Wilson! It is not serious, hein? Merely a scratch. The house door opened, and Monsieur Dimbleval appeared, followed by the servants, carrying candles. 
"'What's the matter?' asked the Baron. "'Is Monsieur Wilson wounded?' "'Oh, it's nothing. A mere scratch,' repeated Sholmes, trying to deceive himself. The blood was flowing profusely, and Wilson's face was livid. Twenty minutes later, the doctor ascertained that the point of the knife had penetrated to within an inch and a half of the heart. "'An inch and a half of the heart!' "'Wilson was always lucky,' said Sholmes, in an envious tone. "'Lucky? Lucky?' muttered the doctor. "'Of course. Why, with his robust constitution, he will soon be out again. Six weeks in bed and two months of convalescence. "'Not more?' "'No, unless complications set in. "'Oh, the devil! What does he want complications for?' Fully reassured, Sholmes joined the Baron in the boudoir. This time the mysterious visitor had not exercised the same restraint. Ruthlessly he had laid his vicious hand upon the diamond snuff-box, upon the opal necklace, and, in a general way, upon everything that could find a place in the greedy pockets of an enterprising burglar. The window was still open. One of the window panes had been neatly cut, and in the morning, a summary investigation showed that the latter belonged to the house then in course of construction. "'Now you can see,' said Monsieur Dimbleval, with a touch of irony, "'it is an exact repetition of the affair of the Jewish lamp.' "'Yes, if we accept the first theory adopted by the police. "'Haven't you adopted it yet? "'Doesn't this second theft shatter your theory in regard to the first? "'It only confirms it, monsieur.' That is incredible. You have positive evidence that last night's theft was committed by an outsider, and yet you adhere to your theory that the Jewish lamp was stolen by someone inside the house? Yes, I am sure of it. How do you explain it? I do not explain anything, monsieur. I have established two facts which do not appear to have any relation to each other, and yet I am seeking the missing link that connects them. His conviction seemed to be so earnest and positive that the Baron submitted to it, and said, "'Very well. We will notify the police.' "'Not at all!' exclaimed the Englishman quickly. "'Not at all. I intend to ask for their assistance when I need it, but not before. But the attack on your friend, that's of no consequence. He is only wounded. Secure the license of the doctor. I shall be responsible for the legal side of the affair.' The next two days proved uneventful. Yet Sholmes was investigating the case with a minute care, and with a sense of wounded pride resulting from that audacious theft, committed under his nose, in spite of his presence, and beyond his power to prevent it. He made a thorough investigation of the house and garden, interviewed the servants, and paid lengthy visits to the kitchen and stables. And, although his efforts were fruitless, he did not despair. I will succeed, he thought, and the solution must be sought within the walls of this house. This affair is quite different from that of the blonde lady, where I had to work in the dark, on unknown ground. This time I am on the battlefield itself. The enemy is not the elusive and invisible Lupin, but the accomplice, in flesh and blood, who lives and moves within the confines of this house. Let me secure the slightest clue, and the game is mine. That clue was furnished to him by accident. On the afternoon of the third day, when he entered a room located above the boudoir, which served as a study for the children, he found Henriette, the younger of the two sisters. She was looking for her scissors. You know, she said to Sholmes, I make papers like that you received the other evening. The other evening? Yes. Just as dinner was over, you received the paper with marks on it. You know, a telegram. Well, I make them, too. She left the room. To anyone else, these words would seem to be nothing more than the insignificant remark of a child, and Sholmes himself listened to them with a distracted air and continued his investigation. But suddenly, he ran after the child and overtook her at the head of the stairs. He said to her, so, you paste stamps and marks on papers? Henriette, very proudly, replied, Yes, I cut them out and paste them on. Who taught you that little game? 
Mademoiselle, my governess. I have seen her do it often. She takes words out of the newspapers and pastes them. What does she make out of them? Telegrams and letters that she sends away. Herlock Sholmes returned to the study, greatly puzzled by the information and seeking to draw from it a logical deduction. There was a pile of newspapers on the mantel. He opened them and found that many words, and, in some places, entire lines had been cut out. But after reading a few of the words which preceded or followed, he decided that the missing words had been cut out at random, probably by the child. It was possible that one of the newspapers had been cut by Mademoiselle, but how could he assure himself that such was the case? Mechanically, Sholmes turned over the school books on the table, then others which were lying on the shelf of a bookcase. Suddenly he uttered a cry of joy. In a corner of the bookcase, under a pile of old exercise books, he found a child's alphabet book, in which the letters were ornamented with pictures, and on one of the pages of that book he discovered a place where a word had been removed. He examined it. It was a list of the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. The word Saturday was missing. Now... The theft of the Jewish lamp had occurred on a Saturday night. Sholmes experienced that slight fluttering of the heart which always announced to him, in the clearest manner, that he had discovered the road which leads to victory. That ray of truth, that feeling of certainty, never deceived him. With nervous fingers he hastened to examine the balance of the book. Very soon he made another discovery. It was a page composed of capital letters, followed by a line of figures. Nine of those letters and three of those figures had been carefully cut out. Sholmes made a list of the missing letters and figures in his memorandum book, in alphabetical and numerical order, and obtained the following result. C-D-E-H-N-O-P-E-Z 237 Well, at first... At first sight, it is a rather formidable puzzle, he murmured. But, by transposing the letters and using all of them, is it possible to form one, two, or three complete words? Sholmes tried it, in vain. Only one solution seemed possible. It constantly appeared before him, no matter which way he tried to juggle the letters, until, at length, he was satisfied it was the true solution since it harmonized with the logic of the facts and the general circumstances of the case. As that page of the book did not contain any duplicate letters, it was probable, in fact quite certain, that the words he could form from those letters would be incomplete, and that the original words had been completed with letters taken from other pages. Under those conditions he obtained the following solution, errors and omissions accepted. R -E -P -O -N -D Z, C H, two three seven. The first word was quite clear, reponde, reply. A letter e is missing because it occurs twice in the word, and the book furnished only one letter of each kind. As to the second incomplete word, no doubt it formed, with the aid of the number two three seven, an address to which the reply was to be sent. They appointed Saturday as the time and requested a reply to be sent to the address CH-237. Or, perhaps, CH-237 was an address for a letter to be sent to the general delivery of some post office, or, again, they might form a part of some incomplete word. Sholmes searched the book once more, but did not discover that any other letters had been removed. Therefore, until further orders, he decided to adhere to the foregoing interpretation. Henriette returned and observed what he was doing. Amusing, isn't it? Yes, very amusing, he replied. But have you any other papers? Or rather, words already cut out that I can paste? Papers? No, and Mademoiselle wouldn't like it. Mademoiselle? Yes, she has scolded me already. Why? "'Because I have told you some things, "'and she says that a person should never tell things about those they love.' "'You are quite right.' 
Henriette was delighted to receive his approbation. In fact, so highly pleased that she took from a little silk bag that was pinned to her dress some scraps of cloth, three buttons, two cubes of sugar, and, lastly, a piece of paper which she handed to Sholmes. See, I give it to you just the same. It was the number of a cab. 8279. Where did this number come from? It fell out of her pocket book. When? Sunday, at Mass, when she was taking out some sous for the collection. Exactly. And now I shall tell you how to keep from being scolded again. Do not tell Mademoiselle that you saw me. Sholmes then went to Monsieur Dimbleval and questioned him in regard to Mademoiselle. The Baron replied, indignantly, Alice Dumont! How can you imagine such a thing? It is utterly impossible. How long has she been in your service? Only a year, but there is no one in the house in whom I have greater confidence. Why have I not seen her yet? She has been away for a few days. But she is here now. Yes, since her return she has been watching at the bedside of your friend. She has all the qualities of a nurse, gentle, thoughtful. Monsieur Wilson seems much pleased. Ah! said Sholmes, who had completely neglected to inquire about his friend. After a moment's reflection, he asked, "'Did she go out on Sunday morning?' "'The day after the theft?' "'Yes.' The Baron called his wife and asked her. She replied, "'Mademoiselle went to the eleven o'clock mass with the children, as usual.' "'But before that?' "'Before that? No. Let me see. I was so upset by the theft, but I remember now that on the evening before— she asked permission to go out on Sunday morning to see a cousin who was passing through Paris, I think. But surely you don't suspect her? Of course not. But I would like to see her. He went to Wilson's room. A woman dressed in a grey cloth dress, as in the hospitals, was bending over the invalid, giving him a drink. When she turned her face, Sholmes recognized her as the young girl who had accosted him at the railway station. Alice de Munn smiled sweetly. Her great, serious, innocent eyes showed no sign of embarrassment. The Englishman tried to speak, muttered a few syllables, and stopped. Then she resumed her work, acting quite naturally under Sholmes's astonished gaze, moved the bottles, unrolled and rolled cotton bandages, and again regarded Sholmes with her charming smile of pure innocence. He turned on his heels, descended the stairs, noticed Monsieur Dimbleval's automobile in the courtyard, jumped into it, and went to Le Valois, to the office of the cab company whose address was printed on the paper he had received from Henriette. The man who had driven carriage number 8279 on Sunday morning not being there, Sholmes dismissed the automobile and waited for the man's return. He told Sholmes that he had picked up a woman in the vicinity of the Parc Monceau, a young woman dressed in black, wearing a heavy veil, and, apparently, quite nervous. Did she have a package? Yes, quite a long package. Where did you take her? Avenue des Ternes, the corner of the Place saint Ferdinand. She remained there about ten minutes, and then returned to Parc Monceau. Could you recognize the house in the Avenue des Ternes? Pablo! Shall I take you there? Presently. First, take me to 36 Quai des Offrevres. At the police office, he saw Detective Janimard. Monsieur Janimard, are you at liberty? If it has anything to do with Lupin, no. It has something to do with Lupin. Then I do not go. What? You surrender? I bow to the inevitable. I am tired of the unequal struggle in which we are sure to be defeated. Lupin is stronger than I am, stronger than the two of us, Therefore, we must surrender. I will not surrender. He will make you, as he has all others. And you would be pleased to see it, eh, Janimard? At all events, it is true, said Janimard, frankly. And since you are determined to pursue the game, I will go with you. Together they entered the carriage and were driven to the Avenue des Ternes. Upon their order, the carriage stopped on the other side of the street, at some distance from the house, 
in front of a little café, on the terrace of which the two men took seats amongst the shrubbery. It was commencing to grow dark. Waiter, said Sholmes, some writing material. He wrote a note, recalled the waiter, and gave him the letter with instructions to deliver it to the concierge of the house which he pointed out. In a few minutes, the concierge stood before them. Sholmes asked him if, on the Sunday morning, he had seen a young woman dressed in black. In black? Yes, about nine o'clock. She went to the second floor. Have you seen her often? No, but for some time, well, during the last few weeks, I have seen her almost every day. And since Sunday? Uh, only once, until today. What? Did she come today? She is here now. Here now? Yes, she came about ten minutes ago. Her carriage is standing in the Place saint Fernand as usual. I met her at the door. Who is the occupant of the second floor? There are two. A modiste, Mademoiselle Langer, and a gentleman who rented two furnished rooms a month ago under the name of Bresson. Why do you say under the name? Because I have an idea that is an assumed name. My wife takes care of his rooms and, well, there are not two shirts there with the same initials. Is he there much of the time? No, he is nearly always out. He has not been here for three days. Was he here on Saturday night? Saturday night. Let me think. Yes, Saturday night he came in and stayed all night. What sort of a man is he? Well, I can scarcely answer that. He's so changeable. He is, by turns, big, little, fat, thin, dark and light. I do not always recognize him. Janimard and Sholmes exchanged looks. That is he, all right, said Janimard. Ah, said the concierge, there is the girl now. Mademoiselle had just emerged from the house and was walking toward her carriage in the Place saint Ferdinand. And there is Monsieur Bresson. Monsieur Bresson? Which is he? The man with the parcel under his arm. But he is not looking after the girl. She is going to her carriage alone. Yes, I have never seen them together. The two detectives had arisen. By the light of the street lamps, they recognized the form of Arsène Lupin, who had started off in a direction opposite to that taken by the girl. "'Which will you follow?' asked Janimard. "'I will follow him, of course. He's the biggest game.' "'Then I will follow the girl,' proposed Janimard. "'No, no,' said Sholmes quickly, who do not wish to disclose the girl's identity to Janimard. "'I know where to find her. Come with me.' They followed Lupin at a safe distance, taking care to conceal themselves as well as possible amongst the moving throng and behind the newspaper kiosks. They found the pursuit an easy one, as he walked steadily forward without turning to the right or left, but with a slight limp in the right leg, so slight as to require the keen eye of a professional observer to detect it. Janimard observed it and said, "'He is pretending to be lame.' Ah, if we could only collect two or three policemen and pounce on our man. We run a chance to lose him. But they did not meet any policemen before they reached the Porte de Ternes, and, having passed the fortifications, there was no prospect of receiving any assistance. We had better separate, said Sholmes, as there are so few people on the street. They were now on the boulevard Victor Hugo. They walked on each side of the street and kept well in the shadow of the trees. They continued thus for twenty minutes, when Lupin turned to the left and followed the Seine. Very soon they saw him descend to the edge of the river. He remained there only a few seconds, but they could not observe his movements. Then Lupin retraced his steps. His pursuers concealed themselves in the shadow of a gateway. Lupin passed in front of them. His parcel had disappeared. And as he walked away, another man emerged from the shelter of a house and glided amongst the trees. He seems to be following him also, said Sholmes in a low voice. The pursuit continued, but was now embarrassed by the presence of the third man. Lupin returned the same way, passed through the Porte de Ternes, and re-entered the house in the Avenue de Ternes. 
The concierge was closing the house for the night when Janimard presented himself. Did you see him? Yes, replied the concierge. I was putting out the gas on the landing when he closed and bolted his door. Is there any person with him? No, he has no servant. He never eats here. Is there a servant stairway? No. Janimard said to Sholmes, I had better stand at the door of his room while you go for the commissary of police in the Rue des Meurs. And if he should escape during that time, said Sholmes, while well, I am here, he can't escape. One to one with Lupin is not an even chance for you. Well, I can't force the door. I have no right to do that, especially at night. Sholmes shrugged his shoulders and said, when you arrest Lupin, no one will question the methods by which you made the arrest. However, let us go up and ring, and see what happens then. They ascended to the second floor. There was a double door at the left of the landing. Janimard rang the bell. No reply. He rang again. Still no reply. Let us go in, said Sholmes. All right, come on, replied Janimard. Yet they stood still irresolute. Like people who hesitate when they ought to accomplish a decisive action, they feared to move, and it seemed to them impossible that Arsène Lupin was there, so close to them, on the other side of that fragile door that could be broken down by one blow of the fist. But they knew Lupin too well to suppose that he would allow himself to be trapped in that stupid manner. No, no, a thousand times no. Lupin was no longer there. Through the adjoining houses, over the roofs, by some conveniently prepared exit, he must have already made his escape, and, once more, it would only be Lupin's shadow that they would seize. They shuddered as a slight noise, coming from the other side of the door, reached their ears. Then they had the impression, amounting almost to a certainty, that he was there, separated from them by that frail wooden door, and that he was listening to them, that he could hear them. What was to be done? The situation was a serious one. In spite of their vast experience as detectives, they were so nervous and excited that they thought they could hear the beating of their own hearts. Janimard questioned Sholmes by a look. Then he struck the door a violent blow with his fist. Immediately they heard the sound of footsteps, concerning which there was no attempt at concealment. Janimard shook the door. Then he and Sholmes, uniting their efforts, rushed at the door, and burst it open with their shoulders. Then they stood still, in surprise. A shot had been fired in the adjoining room, another shot, and the sound of a falling body. When they entered, they saw the man lying on the floor with his face toward the marble mantel. His revolver had fallen from his hand. Janimard stooped and turned the man's head. The face was covered with blood which was flowing from two wounds, one in the cheek, the other in the temple. "'You can't recognize him for blood.' "'No matter,' said Sholmes. "'It is not Lupin.' "'How do you know? You haven't even looked at him.' "'Do you think that Arsène Lupin is the kind of a man that would kill himself?' asked Sholmes with a sneer. "'But we thought we recognized him outside.' "'We thought so, because the wish was father to the thought.' That man has us bewitched. Then it must be one of his accomplices. The accomplices of Arsène Lupin do not kill themselves. Well, then, who is it? They searched the corpse. In one pocket, Herlock Sholmes found an empty pocketbook. In another, Janimard found several louis. There were no marks of identification on any part of his clothing. In a trunk and two valises, they found nothing but wearing apparel. On the mantel there was a pile of newspapers. Janimard opened them. All of them contained articles referring to the theft of the Jewish lamp. An hour later, when Janimard and Sholmes left the house, they had acquired no further knowledge of the strange individual who had been driven to suicide by their untimely visit. Who was he? Why had he killed himself? What was his connection with the affair of the Jewish lamp? Who had followed him on his return from the river? The situation involved many complex questions, many mysteries. Herlock Sholmes went to bed in a very bad humor. 
Early next morning, he received the following telephonic message. Arsène Lupin has the honor to inform you of his tragic death in the person of Monsieur Bresson, and requests the honor of your presence at the funeral service and burial, which will be held at the public expense on Thursday, the 25th of June. End of chapter 7